I was a very, very average student. Uh, if you look at my youth, uh, uh, no hope case. Uh, all right? uh, I think I'll be the one that you, the class will vote as the least likely to, to be anybody or anything. All right? uh, in my, my youth, uh, I, I grew up in Johor Bahru uh, in a fairly middle class family. Uh, and we are quite comfortable. Uh, but I, I wasn't really interested in studying. I spent more time in the drain uh, catching fish. Uh, and um, I, I used to make model aeroplane. Uh, uh, and my report card was really quite spectacular. Right? Very often, cannot came in, you know, because it's all red, uh, with very few islands of blue. Uh, but uh, good for, my good fortune is that my, my family, especially my parents, who were not given any chance for education, they value education a lot, and uh, they all learn, my parents, with, without any education, actually learn how to read. All right? So we have a reading culture in the whole house. And during my time, only 4% of the people went to the university. All right? So if you manage to get a university degree, uh, you've got 20 over people reporting to you the day you graduate. Right? So life was good, because there was no competition, in a way. Yeah? So I had a wonderful opportunities of doing many, many things in my career. All right? Although I, my paid job was largely in the healthcare area, but over the time I was been, uh, you know, given the opportunity to be involved in various things. Some of them are very enjoyable, like serving on the NPARCS board, all right? and also Singapore Tourism Board, uh, but also many other things. But I really spent a really wonderful 38 years in the public healthcare system. Uh, recently I resigned. And then I look back and I say, it was really, really a wonderful and very, very satisfying ride. All right? And I, I, looking back, and I say that I was quite amused that uh, I managed to get away with all those things that I did. All right? And uh, and I actually thoroughly enjoyed it. In fact, I enjoyed it so much that uh, for 38 years that I worked, I haven't taken a single day of MC. All right? Lugi, uh, lugi. Uh, all my entitlement wasted. All right? um, but. Um, I spent almost half my life uh, in Alexander Hospital and Kutikpa Hospital because uh, for some reason I got stuck there. Right? Um, the year 2000, I just finished with the Changi General Hospital opening uh, and I was asked to go to the new Tan Tok Seng Hospital. Uh, I, I declined that, that opportunity, mainly because Tan Tok Seng was very big and it was already built and I didn't like big hospital. All right? I'm a small man, like to do small work, not, not big work. You know? So I asked the minister then for, for you know, I said, where, where you have a problem, you know, uh, I will volunteer to do it. So uh, minister said, uh, I need to restructure uh, Woodbridge IMH uh, uh, in Alexander Hospital. I thought about it, I'm already half mad. If I go to Woodbridge, people will think I'm mad, you know, so I said, okay, no choice, so I go to Alexander Hospital. Right? Uh, but I picked Alexander Hospital for another reason, because the uh, minister wanted to rebuilt that hospital. So I thought there was a golden chance to take it around. And when I came to Alexander Hospital, it was like this, all right, pretty run down. Uh, and uh, it was the last hospital to be restructured. And um, many of the silver servants who did not want to join the restructured hospital, they retreated to that place. And they were very upset when the government wanted to restructure it. And that many of them feel aggrieved that I joined the civil service for life, you know, and then now you change the rule of the game and I have to leave, you know, stuff like that. So, bitter, unhappy, uh, and the condition of the hospital was not, not great. Huh? And the hospital had a, a football field, but they wouldn't let the public play. Yeah? They put a sign up, huh? warning, you know, unauthorized use of the field is prohibited. Trespasser will be reported to police. Uh, and quite typically, they can't even put the sign straight. Right? But essentially, the sign said, go away. I don't want you around. All right. uh, and it was a hospital that uh, the public didn't care to go there. You know, it was half empty. All right. And um, so what to do? Right. It was quite a depressing place. And um, I still remember one of the senior consultants said, uh, we have NUH on one side, SGH on the other side, and we are in the middle. So they say we are in the valley between two tall mountains. Sunlight doesn't even come into the valley, how to survive. All right. Then one day I was walking around in the hospital, I suddenly realized that the building uh, actually looked very elegant, you know. Actually looked like Raffles Hotel. Because it was built during the era. Uh. So I called my good friend, uh, Jenny Chua, who was then the GM of uh, Raffles Hotel. I said, hey, my people very depressed about their building. Uh. Can I bring them to come and see your building? <laughs> she was very gracious. She said, come, come. And we brought a whole bunch of people there. 
And then we told everybody we may be old and uh, tired, all right? But look at Raffles, all right? They managed to make it very elegant, right? So we say we may not be as luxurious as Adidas, but we certainly have to be cleaner than them, right? So we say let's benchmark against them in terms of the physical environment. We even paint the same color so that we look like them. You know? In those days, we look after the poor people. Rich Carlton looked after the rich people. But Rich Carlton was very good in service. So we went to Rich Carlton and said, can help or not? They were extremely kind. They actually allowed us to go there for training, go for, for attachment. Uh, I'm trained to be a Rich Carlton doorman, by the way. Yeah? I spent two days training there. And uh, we brought in many of the, the practices from Rich Carlton into this poor man hospital. All right? and Basically, just copy shamelessly. All right? uh, and very quickly, we were able to change. But the single most important thing about a hospital is actually not the building. It's not uh, all the, the artificial you know, the stuff. It is really about the quality of the doctors and the nurses that you have. All right? And we were quite fortunate. Quite a few very good doctors uh, decided to stay. And some from outside came back from the public sector, private sector, back to our hospital. And very quickly, you know, the whole hospital turned around. All right? uh, and Within 18 months, we basically changed the whole physical environment, which was the easiest to change, uh, with a lot of the staff help. Uh, among them were the gardeners. You know, they went and do the gardening, and, and almost within three, four months, uh, the whole place started turning green, and all the flowers start blooming, and, and it, it changes the whole atmosphere. Uh, the, the football field, uh, we got NTUC income huh, to, to went and uh, do, give, donate a few thousand dollars. We do up the football field, and then we invite the neighbors and everybody, please come and use our football field. Free, free of charge, but on one condition. You mess it up, we'll kick you out. Okay? So everybody came and played, but they didn't mess it up. Uh, and uh, that was how we turned around the whole hospital. Uh, and within three years, we went from one of the worst hospitals in terms of patient satisfaction to top in the patient satisfaction. Uh, and we're very proud that uh, even though we were old hospital, uh, uh, with very limited facility, every single year after that, we topped in the patient satisfaction survey, all right, year after year. When Minister Kaur asked us to build Kutekwat Hospital, uh, he defined Kutekwat as hassle-free hospital. Okay? Build a hospital with a patient right in the middle uh, and make sure that the patients do not suffer any inconvenience when they come in. We define that challenge as patients do not wait too long, preferably A&E patients and clinic patients. 70% of them, we want to serve them within an hour. And second, we say that patients shouldn't have to go all over the place. You know, they will find the shortest distance and the most direct route to get to where they want to be. We define quality in a very simple manner. All right? I have been to at least four, 500 hospitals around the world. In many of these hospitals, the staff will claim that they are the best. But there's something ironical. Every time their own family come to the hospital, they were all busy making phone calls uh, to their colleagues and say, uh, my mother coming can help or not. So that's shipping, right? So we told everybody, we say, quality is provide a level of patient care and services good enough for your own mother without the need for special arrangement. In fact, you're not allowed to make special arrangement. So that if there's anything that is not right or any staff that is not good enough, you better make sure that you get it right, all right? Because when your own mother comes, you're going to get exactly the same thing. And to be fair, every patient is either somebody else's parent or somebody else's child. And we thought that is a fair statement of what quality should be in a healthcare. We adopted a very simple philosophy, learn from everyone, okay? especially from outside industry. The same industry, we tend to do the same thing. Uh, monkey see, monkey do. Uh, then we all copy each other. But learn from everyone, but we follow no one. Because our circumstances is always unique to ourselves. We have to look for what are all the good bits, and then we have to work like hell. Okay? Figure out which are the things that we should apply and how to apply it in the we also took another simple idea, which is everything you want to do, do big. You need to think big. Thinking big and doing big is easier than thinking small and doing small. All right? Think big. But you have to dig deep. All right? You can't do things superficially. And after done doing that, you start small. And then you work very, very fast. All right? Because time and tight, don't wait for you. All right? So this was what we took, and we tried to improve the hospital along the way. And we quickly turn around that place. But what I'm particularly proud of is, again, year after year, that hospital topped in the patient satisfaction. Right? So in the last 12 years, 
uh, Alexander and Good Airport Hospital actually top in 11 or the 12 years uh, in the patient satisfaction. Uh, recently, we opened the uh, Yishun Community Hospital, uh, which is almost equally green. And uh, we try to use, it, use what we learn and try to create a healing environment for the people. But the last three years, actually, I spent a lot of time uh, following our nurses to go to patients' home, all right, to see how uh, people are coping at home and how to provide health care for them because the population is aging rapidly. Uh, and there's no way we can take care of all the people uh, in the hospital. And the hospital is not the best place to look after people anyway. So we want to take care of them at home. And um, going into patients' home is uh, very educational for me. All right? uh, something unusual is this. Uh, our nurses' rapport with the patient's family is so good that when I follow them into the house, uh, uh, they let me see everything. All right? I, I see what is on the wall, then I can see what is in the cupboard. And uh, in fact, the last couple of months, many times they even let me taste their food. And what they eat. And uh, you talk to them, you observe what is happening. And um, I tell you what thing I observe. Like, all right? Many people don't live their life well. Okay? And towards the end of their life, uh, they have no family support, no friends, uh, no money. And um, many of these people actually are afraid to die. And they want to hang on you know, because they haven't done a lot of things. But there's a smaller group of people, they live their life well. Family support, friends, they have enough resources to take care of themselves. And ironically, many of these people are looking forward to death. All right? you know, everything they want to do, they have done. You know? No regrets. All right? So I think it's a good reminder for me anyway, all right, that when you want to leave, leave. When time to die, die. Okay? Uh, don't, when you leave, don't leave properly. And then time to die, don't want to die. That's terrible. Right? <laughs> so anyway, that is uh, what I learned. Looking back, um, my good fortune is being able to work with very inspiring people. All right? They're people who really, really have big impact in their life. You know? And there are many of these people, I mean, I don't have time to elaborate, but if you want to, you can ask me a question of why I put their photograph out there. All right? And I can pinpoint to you the very specific thing that wouldn't have happened except for them. All right? And Singapore benefited, all of us benefited because each of these individuals, they actually did something very special all right, to push things through. Things don't happen, just happen by accident. Uh, it happened because some people believe very strongly in something, and then they just stay and stay and stay to get the work done. I used to share a flat in England when I was studying there with an Algerian. Okay? And he, he gave me this quote. He said, out of 10 caliphs, 9 will go to hell. Not because they are evil people who intentionally do bad things. Caliphs are the highest authority in the Algerian con in the environment. The problem is this, with people of, with, the, with the, of the authority and responsibility they have, every mistake that they make is magnified many times and many people suffer. So as a result, only one in ten uh, can go to heaven. <laughs> All right. I don't mean to be too harsh, but if you take a hundred CEOs of organization, let's take a hundred ministers, a hundred perm sec, or a hundred directors, or whatever. And you look back, and you ask, uh, actually, who actually contribute? What have they done? Actually, it's only about one in ten. Uh, you can pinpoint exactly what they did, and you say, without that guy, this wouldn't have happened. Right. But many people waste their life. All right. Many people are dead. They just follow. They look in front, they look behind, they look at the back. Everybody go in the same direction. So we can't be wrong. Eh? Right? In fact, you try to go out and say, hey, hey, why are you going out? You know? Actually, many people are like the American bison. Right? There used to be millions of these uh, on the plane of America. They almost went extinct. Right? Because they're just all following the same each other. Some years ago, Harvard Business Review published a very nice article talking about energy and focus. And it says that actually, some people are uh, no energy, no focus. All right? Some people, very high focus, but very low energy, hardly move on. All right? Then some people, a lot of energy, but no focus, like the chicken without head, you know, running all over the place. Right? Only about 10% got focus and got energy. All right? Like the eagles or like the dung beetle. Right? Uh, I'm a great admirer of dung beetle, as Daniel said. Right? Why? 
You know, in Singapore, there are 36 species of dung beetle. Sometimes when a dog owner walks the dog, eh, and then the dog poop and then pretend didn't see, walk away. But you find that two, three days later, eh, the dung will disappear. Eh, no? That's because usually in the night, you know, dung beetle will come, they will dig a hole eh, and then bury the, the shit underground. All right? And then actually they clean up the environment, they replenish the nutrients into the soil. All right, and then we don't smell the shit anymore. Right? Dung beetles are really the unsung hero, actually. Right? And the dung beetles are actually very highly focused. You can't stop them on high energy. And uh, they're self-aware, you know, and they, they don't care to be the eager. Actually, they're quite happy to be the dung beetle. Right? And they're very clear what is their purpose in life. You know? right? A very strong will. You, can, you can never stop them. And you don't have to motivate them. Right? They'll motivate themselves. And the philosophy of dung beetle is that when no one is responsible, I will take care of it. Right, you just leave it to me, I'll sort it out. Right. Actually, the world needs a lot more dung beaters. Huh? Right. Uh, and for the young people, if you think I'm talking rubbish, huh? uh, I encourage to spend your life uh, eating dung. Huh? Right. Because if you eat shit, huh, you will never starve a day for the rest of your life because the world is full of shit. Huh? <laughs> I learned something from Dennis as well. I think I borrow a little bit about these five Cs. Right. I observe that people who have impact and people that seem to be quite successful in life, huh? They have these five C's, uh, not, not the original five C's that people talk about. Right? And the first one, the five C's, is actually commitment. Right? President Naden, at one stage of his life, he was extremely unhappy and he wanted to resign. He went and see his friend and his friend asked him a simple question. He said, why are you here? Okay. And according to Naden, he went back and he thought about it. And then he realized why he was there. And then he stayed, and he stayed, and he stayed. He served the countries in many different capacities. And I thought he was a really very, very wonderful and very, very successful president for the country. Right? Because he figured out why he was there in this world. Right? I bought this book for my children. Now, the book has got some interesting concept. It says that you better figure out in life huh, what is your passion, what is your talent, and how you can be useful to other people. All right? Now, it's not easy to know what is your passion and what is your talent and how you can be useful to people. Uh, you actually have to spend a lot of time to think about it. If you can figure out what is your passion, your talent, and how you can be useful to other people, I think all right, you will do well in life. All right? And uh, you will be valued and you can do well. But you need to be competent because if you can't get things done, forget it. Uh, nobody's going to waste time on you. All right? You need to have a mindset of wanting to improve, wanting to learn all the time. I always encourage people to read. Uh, reading is the best way to improve your knowledge. You don't have to experience yourself. Right? Other people tell you, share with you, and all this thing. Else. Another very simple trick to learn uh, is actually ask for tutorial. Right? When I first became chairman of NEA, uh, uh, I honestly didn't know what I'm supposed to do. I went and called some of the older generation people in NEA, include, and then some minister, some PMSEC, and so on. And I really called them on the phone, and I said, hey, I don't know what to do. Uh, can get tutorial from you or not? And I learned one thing in life. Huh? Good people are very willing to share. If you're humble enough to ask, they will spend time to explain to you and tell you. Wow, and the story they tell me, uh, I tell you, you can't find it anywhere. All right? uh, because it is their personal experience of 30, 40 years. All right? And of course, doing. The best way to learn is to do. All right? But don't just do. End of every single day, you better go back and reflect. Okay, did you did it go right or didn't go right? You know, every week you better reflect. Every month you better reflect. Every year you better go for a retreat and reflect. I say, think, think, do, think, do, think, do, think, do, think, do. All right. Some people think, 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 and then they get constipated. Nothing happened. Okay. You also need courage. Some people hold themselves back because they are afraid of rejection. They are afraid that people will go against them. But to have courage, it helps uh, that you have some degree of freedom. For young people especially, when you, especially the first job that you get, don't go and chase money. All right? Go and look for the experience that you want. All right? Because you can, you, you can, if you, money is all important to you, you may end up taking a job that you know, you're stuck in a corner, uh, and then later you actually can't learn anything, you can't grow from it. The very important thing is completion. A lot of people start this, start that, start this, start that. They don't finish. What for? <laughs> so I think it's very important. Once you give your commitment, you're going to do something. 
stay on the course. Don't get distracted. Even if people give you a fantastic job offer, a fantastic pay rise, stay because you make a promise. You will face setback. You know, nothing you do will be smooth selling. Right? Things will always go wrong. All right? You must actually always pick yourself up and say, what the heck, you know, I have to do it, I do it. And I find another way around it and I get it. All right? I think delivering on promise is what really, really counts. For people to trust you. The world is really, really changing. 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs were the king of the land. All right? They were so proud because they're so majestic. But the weather was changing. And then funny little creature was turning up. All right? Believe me, eh? the world is currently right, going right underneath this. Globalization, the internet, eh? and then genomics and so on. It's going to completely change the world. What brought Singapore here is not going to bring Singapore forward. I think that is a very, very beautiful African saying. The gazelle wake up every morning and say that he better outrun the fastest lion or he's going to be dead. The lions wake up and say that I better outrun the slowest gazelle or I'm going to be hungry. Actually, every day you wake up, you better run the hell. And I think Singapore is the gazelle. Don't ever think that you can slow down and say, I need a rest. All right? Look at other countries, they all can relax. You can't. All right? You'll be eaten. Philip Yu is right. Every five years or so, you need to find the next cycle, the next thing that will keep you afloat. Whether you are a nation or a company or a person, nothing is permanent. In my mind, we need to have a bounded conversation on three big items. One is how do we live together in harmony? The second question is how do we earn a living? And how do we earn a living as a nation? How do we earn a living as an organization? And how we earn a living as an individual? May not be the same, you know. One is good for one, may be terrible for the other one. And I think we better have these serious conversations about how do we earn a living in this world? Because the world doesn't owe us a living, by the way. Huh? The last question is, how do we defend ourselves? All right? And it's no longer just about buying jet fighter and uh, you know, nice battleships. You know? uh, there are all sorts of things that can happen to you. And how do you defend yourself? All right. I think we need a change in mindset. And the mindset is very, very important. The first is whether we have abundance or a scarcity mindset. Do we see opportunity or do we see problem? I elaborate about abundance. Many people have a scarcity mindset. Singapore doesn't have enough land. It is so crowded already. All right? So keep foreigners out. Go away. That is called a scarcity mindset. All right? So this is the problem. This is what we have. No good. Well, if you take that approach, the world actually is going to be very small. No? And you will only go downhill. The opposite is abundance. The people with the abundance mindset, uh, when you tell them something, uh, let's play Beethoven's Symphony 9. Wow, this is such a beautiful piece of music. I am sure out there, there will be many musicians who will love to play Beethoven's Symphony 9 with us. And the person with the abundance mindset will very quickly gather 180 orchestra and a thousand choir and they'll be building beautiful music. There's a big difference between scarcity and abundance. I think leaders are important. I have seen many organizations, government agencies, where they have lions you know, among the staff, but they are led by a ship. Everything cannot do, dare not do. After a while, even the lions behave like sheep. Okay? <laughs> On the other hand, when you have a lion as a leader, even ships will begin to behave like lions. All right? And I think we need more lions and not ships. Some years ago, I picked up this book by accident. It turned out to be a very good book to read. Okay? And it say the five secrets you must discover before you die. No? One is be true to yourself. Live a life of no regret. All right? And become love. When you do something out of love, it, it, the feeling and what you do is very different when you do out of hatred. Live the moment. All right? Every day count. Every minute count. 
and then the final one is actually give more than you take. Another book that I happen to read was this book, Drive. Many people think that uh, the way you motivate people is to set target, set KPI, and then you pay them. Big fat bonus. According to this author and a lot of research, it shows that when you do that, actually people underperform. He said people perform the best uh, is when they have a purpose, they have achieved a certain degree of mastery of what they do, and they have autonomy. Looking back at my life, I am really, really glad that I have a purpose in what I do. And I like to think that I've achieved some degree of mastery in the few things that I choose to do. Now back to you. Why are you here? Why are we here now? Why are we here in Singapore? Why are we here in this world? I think it's worthwhile to reflect and to think about it. All right? I think all of us want to be happy. But there are different types of happiness. The one type of happiness is you can buy a handbag, you can buy a new car, you can buy a new you know, iPhone or whatever. But that kind of happiness actually lasts only for a few hours, at most a few days. The second type of happiness uh, is you are engrossed in reading a book that you love. And then you read, read, read until 5 o'clock in the morning, you say, hey, 5 for you, dear. <laughs> That's called the engaged life. Yeah, that one lasts a bit longer. But apparently, the deeper sense of happiness uh, is you do something meaningful for somebody else, or you plant a tree somewhere, all right, and you can see the tree grow and provide the shades for everybody. And that is called authentic happiness. So my parting shot is, got money, give money. Got sweat, give sweat. No money, no sweat, give blood. Okay? <laughs> uh, actually, the best is you do all. Uh, all right? And I guarantee you, the more you give, the happier you are. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Liang.